Hi, I am Uli. I am at the Ugly Duck Conference, the EIF venture capital conference that nobody in Europe should miss. I am going to speak today about the dynamics of the venture capital industry, update you on the last performance of uh, all the market segments. And more than that, I'm going to look into the reasons why successful funds are becoming successful. And finally, I'm going to venture with three predictions on the future that lies ahead of us. Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to Ugly Duck 2019. This is uh, truly overwhelming to see uh, this massive crowd and actually I think we are about uh, twice the crowd of last year coming together here, which in itself is undoubtedly a sign uh, of the dynamics and the momentum that this industry actually has. So I'd like to thank you for joining us here to a, celebrate the successes of our industry, to reflect on the things that we potentially can do even better, and uh, lastly, to debate with us uh, what's the world that is lying ahead of us that we are going to address in the future. And uh, if I look at the talk that I would like to share with you today, uh, it's spanning pretty much across the spectrum. Of course, I will not fall short of the expectation to share with you the latest performance data on the industry, which I know that you're very eager to hear. But uh, this year, I'm not going to stop just at the figures that we can read in the headlines. What I'd like to do with you this year is to actually dive one layer deeper in uh, analyzing what drives this industry, what makes a successful fund a successful fund. What are the common features that we see and also reflect on how the risk profiles between the different market segments compare to each other. And finally, I would like to share with you three personal predictions of what's going to be ahead of us. But uh, I'm going to keep the suspense for that for later. So let us dive into the um, performance indicators of this industry and uh, reflect on uh, where we stand today compared to one year ago. When we look at the charts uh, that I'm going to show you in the next few minutes, it's uh, very similar to what uh, you have seen last year. And uh, the performance that we have been celebrating already last year has been very similar to what uh, we've been sharing in the um, presentation last year. Um, you see that the performance indicators uh, for the vintage years from 2006 onwards are pointing again into the direction of positive return territory. Even the vintage years 2015 and 16 so are uh, off scale on this chart. We can't um, f picture the uh, top performance funds in these charts anymore. The same thing um, applies when we look at performance indicators for funds that actually are today in the money. Uh, when we look at the performance of uh, the funds um, from 2000 and uh, three, uh, four onwards, where we have actually been predominantly negative territory. From 2005 to 2016, we basically have across the board most of the funds in the third quartile being in the money. And as we push this further to the perspective of what happens to our top performing funds, and this is the IRR range of our top 50 funds, look at the evolution that we have been uh, witnessing from 2017 onwards. In 2017, I was um, showing to you um, figures at the low end of the top 50 funds of 10% return. At the high end, we went to 66%. 2018 moved the lower bar to 14% and the top performance to 111. And look what happened uh, in the performance of uh, the portfolio in 2019. Well, I think it is easy to um, celebrate the high performance outlier of 371% of net IRR uh, to investors. But what is more remarkable on this chart is actually the cut of performance for getting into the top 50 funds of our portfolio, which if you compare it to the value of 2000 and, uh, 
17 that I've been on, uh, showing you on the screen just before, it has actually doubled from 10 to 20%. And this actually gives a performance that is very remarkable, no matter what asset class we are going to uh, compare it to. Um, I've, last year, I've been showing you also um, zoom-ins on the performance of emerging fund managers to established fund managers. And um, I'd like to do the same thing here because there is one very, very surprising element that we have to report this year, which is that if we look at the top five performing funds in our portfolio, we do realize that actually four out of those five are delivered by emerging managers. Yes, it is true that if we look at the top 10 and the top 20, that uh, established managers are conquering back some of that territory, as uh, it logically and intuitively would be, and that consequently, if we look at the distribution of returns and the volatility that you expect when establishing, uh, investing in an um, emerging fund manager is a little bit bigger, it is uh, absolutely fair to say that um, emerging fund managers have made a very safe footprint in this asset class. When we look at the zoom in between life sciences and ICT as a sector approach, those that are involved in life sciences will be happy to hear that uh, also this year, the best performing fund in our portfolio is a life sciences fund. And also in the share that life sciences funds have in our top performing funds, the share of life sciences in that uh, list of top performing funds is superior to the um, share that uh, life sciences investments take in our overall asset allocation. It remains remarkable that life sciences funds continue to outperform on the first and second quartile, the ICT segment. But um, as I promised you in the introduction, I'd like to dive deeper in today's uh, talk when looking at the performance of this industry and look at what are the value drivers of fund performance when it comes to the uh, underlying dynamics in the portfolio. First of all, let us look at uh, what are typical fund sizes and uh, what are typical diversification uh, parameters for funds. And if you look at the comparison between uh, the uh, established managers and emerging managers, you will see that we are looking at bigger portfolios um, when looking at established managers compared to emerging managers, which largely is due to the fact that uh, emerging managers frequently have to deal with constraints in the fund fundraising environment. Not many of them, at the first shot, get to the target fund size they would ideally like to look at when implementing their investment strategy. And as a result, they need to concentrate the portfolio in a different manner than established managers that operate from an ideal fund size portfolio. But when it comes to the um, a presence of value drivers, the ratio of uh, how many value drivers you have got in the, in the portfolio compared to the total number of uh, companies, that is roughly the same uh, in those two categories. The same thing actually applies to the comparison between ICT and life sciences sectors. Again, life sciences uh, typically have a less diversified portfolio, and again, this may be due to the fact that life sciences in the past has had a much more difficult stance in the fundraising process compared to life sciences funds. But again, here it is um, noticeable that uh, the ratio of um, value drivers in the portfolio is uh, very similar to what we observed uh, before. But let us look even further down to um, the importance of winners in a portfolio. When we look at um, the portfolio of uh, life sciences and ICD funds and look at the uh, ratio of write-offs, it is um, noticeable that between the two life sciences and ICD funds, the dropout rate in the portfolio is almost identical. 
What is, uh, however, um, different in those two categories is that the number of loss-making companies is uh, statistically significantly higher in the life sciences segment compared to the ICD segment, which uh, intuitively would translate into an impact on the return figures, but that is actually not necessarily the case I will, um, sh as I will show you in the following slide. This slide actually shows you the comparison of the median multiple on cost for uh, life sciences and ICD funds and the average multiple of cost for ICD and life sciences funds. And in both those categories, actually, the life sciences sector outperforms the ICD segment by quite a margin which means that on the loss-making companies in a life sciences portfolio, actually fund managers and funds recuperate a bigger share of the invested capital than this is the case in the ICD segment. But more importantly and more surprisingly, we need to look at this. This is actually a ratio that we have derived from all the investments across our portfolio in all funds and their underlying portfolios. And if we look at the investments made in each of those companies and sum it up, the money that we actually got back from our life sciences portfolio returns us 100% of the capital invested. While it's only 60% of the capital invested in ICT companies has been returned cash on cash as of today. This is a counterintuitive result of the analysis because uh, typically when we look at the life sciences industry and the performance uh, expectation and anticipation that investors have, they typically would associate with life sciences uh, capital intensity, high volatility, long-term, illiquid. Well, in terms of realized results, and cash on cash returns, our portfolio actually tells the contrary. Let us move this further and look at the importance of winners in the dynamics of the return of a fund. Um, working with the same sample of data, looking at all the portfolio companies that we've got in our portfolio, and attributing them in different categories and classes of their contribution to the overall value of a fund. I've divided them in the categories of uh, companies contributing, contributing individually less than 1% of the overall fund value, 1% to 5% of the overall fund value, 5 to 10% of the overall fund value, 10 to 20% of the overall fund value, and ultimately 20 to 100% of the fund value. And if you look at the importance of those different uh, pockets of uh, value contribution, you will see that across the board of all our funds, 42% of all companies that in individual contribution contribute less than 1% to the value of the fund that they're invested in from, the aggregate of this value is 3% of the overall fund value. Whilst on the other side, 8% of the portfolio companies generate 39% of the entire value. This is on all our fund portfolio no matter, no uh, differentiation of the performance of the underlying funds. So let us look what happens if we zoom in on the funds, on funds that deliver better performance. Here is the view of uh, funds having a DVPI of bigger than 1.5. And you will notice that the shift towards the value drivers in the portfolio in terms of the contribution to value creation is getting even bigger, to 48% in this sample. And I haven't stopped there because I'm pushing that to the real stars, funds that have actually returned cash on cash two times the money invested from investors. And here, 
of the portfolio companies of the underlying funds have delivered 79% of uh, the total value created in those funds. If you look at this uh, evolution as we look at the increase in the underlying performance of funds, the necessity of concentrating capital on the winners in the portfolio becomes very obvious. And again, I have tried to break that down in um, the perspective life sciences against ICT. Here you see on the left-hand left side the life sciences distribution and on the right side the ICT distribution. Intuitively, if we go by the perception of the market, one would assume that uh, the concentration of value drivers in a life science portfolio is much more binary than uh, in ICT funds. As a matter of fact, the contrary is the case. This may very well be due to the fact that uh, in the build-up of value creation in a fund portfolio, you get much quicker to uplifts in an ICT portfolio, which is uh, linked to the number of users of a car-sharing facility or whatever, and that's going to be priced very expensively in the market, whilst in the life sciences sector, you need to wait for milestones delivered in a clinical trial or for an agreement with a pharma company that contributes to licensing payments or an exit altogether. But fact is, if we look at this distribution, it is fair to conclude that the performance in the life sciences sector is actually based on a broader footing than in the ICT space. And then there's one more aspect that I would like to look at with you, which is this species that has populated the landscape of the VC industry over the last few years. Uh, ten years ago, very jealously looked at by the European VC community as being something that only was prospering in the United States. It's the emergence of unicorns. There's a lot of debate on unicorns on whether they are really essential in a fund portfolio whether they are not just something that you can use for marketing because you have been associated with one. But how does it actually translate into the performance of a fund that is invested in a unicorn? Well, I've look, been looking at uh, what's the percentage of top performing funds that we've got in the portfolio that do have exposure to a unicorn. In the top 10 funds, 60% of the life sciences funds and 70% of the ICD funds have exposure to a unicorn, at least one unicorn. And in the top 20 and top 30, the ratio doesn't change massively with a slight advantage uh, in the ICT uh, space because ICT generally has produced more unicorns than life sciences on a global base. So I think it is fair to say that uh, unicorns do help top performing funds to conquer that position. But um, it kind of uh, struck me in, in analyzing this and made me curious about the question of um, how do unicorns in general behave in terms of the capital efficiency in the market? What type of returns do investors create that get directly or indirect, indirectly exposed to unicorn exposure? And here is something which I wanted to share with you because it can make us a tiny little bit proud from a European perspective. What I'm going to show you is the capital efficiency expressed as the ratio between the realized value either at the time of graduation, meaning at the point in time where a unicorn for the first time crossed the mark of one billion valuation, and at the time of an exit compared to the amount of money from venture capital that has been invested in that very company. And if we look at the comparison between the US, Asia and Europe in that respect, it is actually quite remarkable that, um, yes, in the, 
ICD segment, the US market outperforms everybody else, whilst in the life sciences market, actually Europe outperforms the rest of the world. But more surprisingly is what happens if we look at the figures at the point in time of exit. Look what happens. Whilst both Asia and USA are unable, in average, to maintain the capital efficiency that they have reflected in their portfolio valuations prior to exit, Europe actually in both segments manages to increase it. And that points at a very crucial differentiation between the US market and the European market, which is the conscious use of capital in the investment process. Whilst the availability of money almost uh, unlimited in the US uh, markets drives valuations and the size of investments at various stages of a company pretty much up, European fund managers need to operate with a much more conscious um, limitation of uh, capital for the investments that, they were, that were conducting. And at the point in time where they are bringing a company to the market, they are able to realize upswings in valuations that both Asia, Asia and the US are not able to sustain. Now, with this I would like to lead to the most risky part of my presentation, and uh, I am clearly uh, claiming that this is my personal opinion and the compliance officer is going to give you a handout of a disclaimer afterwards that you should not follow this as an investment advice. But I'm going to make um, three predictions on the future of um, the market. And the first one is that we are headed into a market crash. And when I'm saying we are headed into a market crash, it's not something that is going to happen somewhere in the future, because obviously it is going to happen somewhere in the future. I'm saying this is going to happen at relatively short term. I would say six months I would give it. And the reason why I say that this is a convenient prediction to make is because um, if I get this right, you're going to think that I'm a guru. And if I get it wrong, you still are not going to be mad at me because you're going to continue to shuffle money big time from the exits that you're going to make in the market, right? Um, that's my take, but I have a few other reasons why I believe this is going to happen. The first one is what I call the origin of value that we observe in the market today. And for that, I've been comparing the evolution of GDP growth to the evolution of market valuations. And as you can see, up to the year 2010, 11, 12 around, there has been a pretty close correlation between those curves with two kind of hiccups, which was the tech crash in 2000, 2001, and the uh, financial crisis in 2006 and 2007. But from 2012 onwards, we have actually a gap that is growing massively. And it is clear that from that point onwards, market valuations has been strongly driven by an excess of liquidity and not necessarily by value creation in the underlying companies. And that has been the case also previously, because if we look at the interest rate environment in comparison to that, it becomes obvious that whenever the stock markets actually dived, it was at a point in time where the interest rates have peaked. That was the case in 87 when we went into the Russian crisis. It was the case in uh, 99, 2000 uh, when we had the tech crash. It was the case in 2006, 2007 when we had uh, the start of the big financial crisis. And if you look at the interest rate environment today, what does it tell us? Actually, it would say, no danger, because we are no, not anywhere near to a peak of the interest rates today. And actually, 
if we look at the evolution in the market, there is no danger that they're going to go up very big time in the short term. But there's one thing that actually makes the market vulnerable today, which is the lack of predictability of trade dynamics. And this lack of predictability of trade dynamics that has actually an impact on the growth potential of national economies and has brought a number of major economies at the edge of a recession already today is something that we need to worry about. Because when Apple in 2018 gave its profit warning in November, in six weeks' time they lost one-third of their market valuation. So markets are nervous about that. And actually, even in the space that we are operating in, we have got signs that investors are no longer blindly following anything that comes to the market, but uh, are looking with caution about what is happening in the underlying value creation potential, the profitability, the perspective for profitability in the companies we invest in. The second prediction that I'm making is that if I'm right on the first one, the safest hedge that you can actually take is to invest in venture capital. That is counterintuitive in the sense because five to ten years ago, European venture capital was probably considered as being part of charity. And you would not hedge your assets by donating, would you? And the reason why I'm saying that we see today is a counterintuitive hedge is not even linked to the fact that VC is so long-term that no matter the downturn, you're going to survive it because until you realize value in venture capital, the crisis will be over. It is more because the business models that are funded by venture capital today have dramatically changed. We are starting from 20 years ago with technology companies that have been enabling traditional businesses in becoming more modern. A data processing system, a logistic system being supported by technology. This was a time where technology companies and traditional businesses have been mutually dependent on each other. We've been moving into an era in the first decade of this century where um, Business models in technology companies and tradition, tr traditional businesses have been complementary to each other because technologies have been used to diversify businesses. Diversify businesses in terms of bringing online, offline business online, in diversifying distribution channels, in automate, automating uh, production processes and the like. And today, if we look at business models, they have become antagonists. Today, the objective of technology companies is no longer to make traditional businesses prosper. It is to do business differently, to disrupt businesses that have in the past been done in a totally different and completely um, opposite way. And uh, in doing so, those companies are disrupting traditional business models that we have got uh, all over the place in our asset allocations and that will be affected in a market downturn. And if that happens, you better be exposed to the businesses of tomorrow than to the business models of yesterday. My third prediction is that we are going to see the emergence of new concepts of profitability. When we look at um, what happened over the recent decade of um, uh, businesses, we see that uh, the concept of sharing economy has been ent entering the center, of center stage all over the place. We are used to it now that we have got a different use of resources. And the breakthrough in this type of business models is going to come with the personalized availability of services and products that is going to replace the concept of ownership. If you, as a consumer, get on a rented basis 
what you would otherwise have bought in a way that is so tailor-made to your specific needs that it is almost as if you had it tailored for you and produced specifically to your uh, requirements, then the desire of having it in your ownership, binding capital that you don't use most of the time, would not make sense anymore. And this will require, actually, traditional businesses to rethink their own business models. What we will have to go for is companies looking at ways how they can get paid for selling less. How they can actually move from a sales cycle management that looks at sustaining a linear growth model to a concept that looks at life cycle management of their products and services. And ultimately, this is relating to the question, how can business models of tomorrow monetize societal value? 20 years ago, having an unethical business was no issue. 10 years ago, unethical businesses might have been avoided by certain investors. Today, we have societal value being reflected in the investment decisions and the consumer decisions in a way that actually allow you to monetize and charge more for the products that you're selling. So you get paid for that uh, responsibility. And this will ultimately translate in what I predict as being the emergence of impact-weighted accounting in uh, five years' time from now. Actually, as we speak, there are two major business schools in the world, Harvard University and uh, Oxford in the UK, that are looking at the concept of uh, how to integrate impact responsibility of companies in the financial statements of companies. And if that actually happens, if that materializes, this will affect the cost of capital of those companies, be it on the public markets or be it because of you. Because of you, because also your access to capital will depend on the very awareness of uh, this impact um, availability uh, going forward. So, impact investing is, impact uh, consciousness is going to be the new mantra of the financial industry going forward. And obviously, it is also for uh, the um, European Investment Fund, a remit to live up to the accountability of our impact that we are creating in the market. Excuse me, I just got a... Oh yes, this is just a reminder that I should share the slides with all of you, which is done. You got it on your application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.